that was so weak. That was, that was, all, I mean, I got in at 2 a.m. last night, and I feel a little peppier than that. Good morning. Good morning, Austin. Good morning, Nick. Um, I'm Nick Grossman. Uh, I'm from Union Square Ventures, a venture capital firm based in New York City uh, that invests in web and mobile platforms. Uh, I'll introduce our panelists in a second, and we're here to talk about uh, the sharing economy, the new workforce, the changing face of labor, uh, and what it all means for, our, for policy and for innovation. Um, so let me uh, first introduce briefly our panelists, and then I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, here we have Sarah Lieberstein uh, from the National Employment Law Project. Uh, we have Michael Hayes, who's from uh, the Consumer Technology Association, and we have Arun Sundararajan uh, from NYU Stern School of Business, uh, all of whom uh, are sort of deeply engaged on the issues that we're going to discuss today and bring a different perspective. Um, just before we uh, really get started, I'm just curious about who here is in the room. Um, our folks, I mean, raise your hand if you're sort of tech company, hacker, you know, innovator, if, you, if you're a maker, builder in the space, if that's who you are. Just a couple. All right, if you're from government or sort of regulator, lawmaker, policy person, all right, advocate, uh, nonprofit, lobbyist type. Okay, so like pretty good mix. Other students? What is the rest of the room doing? Yeah, who, who, <laughs> what, who wasn't, <laughs> right, who are the rest of you? <laughs> a brand, okay. For any other brands? Okay. Anybody else who's not represented, who, who, who feels unrepresented? Filmmaking. Filmmaking, nice. Any musicians in the house? International. International, that's good. Insurance. Insurance, that's a big one. That actually is important. That's good, I'm glad you're here. Um, we're gonna make insurance fun today. Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, so let's get started. Um, I'll ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves um, we have about an hour, or maybe exactly an hour. Uh, we're going to uh, cover a couple of, of high-level points to get started, and then we'd like to open it up and uh, do a lot of Q&A with you and maybe folks out on Twitter and Periscope and other uh, live streaming things. Uh, we're going to talk broadly about uh, sort of the issue of the sharing economy, the gig economy, the impact on policy and regulation and innovation. Um, we're going to touch on specifically the impacts of labor and what this means for workers and the future of labor movements and organizing and support. Uh, we're going to talk about how this impacts platforms and uh, the work platform themselves, the web and mobile platforms that are generating a lot of this work or, or bringing it to market. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what this means for cities and how cities are adapting or not adapting and how that relationship is working. And then maybe we'll talk a little bit about sort of the future. Uh, so with that, uh, if you guys wouldn't mind just briefly just saying uh, who you are, uh, you know, what you do and how it connects to this topic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe uh, a fun fact that no one knows about you that you want to tell the internet right now. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Lieberstein. Um, I'm a senior staff attorney at the National Employment Law Project, or NELP, based in New York. It's a national, nonpartisan, nonprofit policy and advocacy organization that fights to improve rights for low-wage workers, the unemployed, and people with a criminal background who are hoping to access work. And NELP, throughout its 45-year-long history, has focused, among other issues, on improving protections for workers in contingent or precarious jobs. And so in, in many ways, a lot of um, the buzz and the hype around the sharing economy, or what we call the on-demand economy, is great because it's the latest, but definitely the most publicized and high profile culmination of these larger trends that we have seen taking place in work for decades, or as we were talking about, you know, possibly centuries. You know, my grandparents worked in sweatshops, and in some ways they have contended with some of the same issues that we're seeing today. But what's going on is, you know, we now have 40. 2% of the workforce earning $15 or less an hour. Fewer people have reliable schedules. Um, many fewer workers are getting the benefits and protections that they need from their jobs. And so this latest hype and public discussion around the on-demand economy, I think, is helping us to have the discussion that we need to about how to ensure that workers in all different types of jobs, no matter who their employer or the label that their, their company gives them, is earning enough to live on, to support their family, and it has the protections that they need both to do well in their jobs and to prepare for a career. Fun fact. Oh, 
Um, I was a union organizer before I went to law school. That's not that surprising. Uh, Let's go to another one. Let's go to fun fact number two. And even more fun fact is that I was a salt for the union, which is um, means that I got a, a job working at a hotel to help the union to organize a hotel. Okay, very good. Michael. Um, I'm Michael Hayes, uh, amongst uh, a number of other policy issues at the Consumer Technology Association. I handle our sharing economy policy. And you know, as Gary mentioned, the Consumer Technology Association is a member organization of about <coughs> 2,200 companies. And that spans from everyone in the, the biggest names of technology to our startup members, which are our most important members. And these are the people that are creating the new technologies of tomorrow, technologies that a lot of people are not even using yet. You know, we have member companies that have one or two people, and they already are engaging with us to make sure that federal policies, that state policies, that local policies uh, are fostering an environment in which they can create a thriving company in which they can innovate. Uh, on the sharing economy, we're thinking about the here and now, and we're thinking about the future. In the here and now, we want to make sure that entrepreneurs have the ability to take advantage of these platforms so that they can succeed, so that they can be their own boss and they can provide services and earn extra income. And we want to make sure that <coughs> consumers, you know, whether they're trying to get a vehicle for the weekend or whether they're trying to go on a vacation and stay in a neighborhood that they've never been to before, or whether they are you know, looking for a handyman service, whether they're looking for someone to build their Ikea bed, whatever it is, that they are able to easily access that absolutely seamless with the click of a button. You know, and that is a, a revolution of something that's always existed, right? These services have already been provided for, for centuries often. Uh, and, and what we're seeing now is we're seeing an absolutely unprecedented revolution of being able to access those services, and that's because of technology, just being able to provide increased efficiency uh, to a market that really has existed for uh, as long as people have been providing goods and services to each other. Okay, fun fact. Fun fact. Um, other than a few Hungarian staples, I never cooked the same thing twice. Wow. A few Hungarian <coughs> staples, I mean, that could go a long way. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And paprikash, you yeah, know, every yeah. Tuesday. Papr and paprikash, chirke, yeah. you know, we do that a little bit, and then, you know, like, tudos tasta, and then kapostas uh, tasta, and other than that, yeah, it's just, like, wide open. Mmm, delicious. All right, Arun. Okay, hi, my name is Arun Sundarajan. I'm a professor at New York University. Michael and I coordinated on outfits this morning. Um, <laughs> she, she, Nick, Nick and Sarah were on the call, but they sort of reneged on our agreement that we would all come dressed the same way. <laughs> I'm deeply disappointed, great. yeah. It's a sharing economy uniform. So um, <clears throat> I'm a, I'm a professor. It, it helps for sort of clothes swapping, like you're on the fly if, um, if there's like, you know, a problem when you're watching one of those shows. So I'm a professor at New York University. I, um, my research is about how digital technologies change things. For the last five years, I've been spending a lot of time focused on the sharing economy, what people call the sharing economy. Um, and what I see as sort of, a, sort of the early stages of a broader transition in the economy towards a new way of organizing economic activity. Um, and I'll say more about that as we get into the panel, but... Um, and you just wrote a book recently called... Yes, I just wrote a book recently called The Sharing Economy. Um, <laughs> it uh, comes out on June 14th, um, and um, it's about the sharing economy. <laughs> um, so um, that's, that's all I'm going to tell you about it. I mean, beyond that, it's kind of up to you. And to fun go. fact. Um, well, I went to graduate school before I became a professor. Um, that's not really I'm, 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 just, I'm teasing Sarah. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, whenever I'm sitting on one of these panel chairs, I feel like I'm about to topple over. And so I'm sort of constantly shifting around. Now everybody in the room go like this. Yeah. <laughs> the room falls yeah, over that way. Sort of. Um, and uh, I, I, I take pictures of all of my panel audiences. Um, and so I need you guys to smile. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm serious. I, I, this, 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 is, uh, this is, I don't know how fun this is, but it's a fact. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, the reason why I do this is because I figure I'm going to have grandkids one day, and um, they're not going to listen to me, and so I'm going to show them these pictures. <laughs> and I'm going to say, see, people used to come and sit people down. People used and to listen to me. You know, I think pictures so, will be obsolete by then. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> that's right. 
I'll sort of beam this sort of holograph of like you, know, you guys, so you're memorialized for posterity. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So just to uh, start from kind of a high level, I think everybody here and everybody on the internet is familiar with the basics, right? We we've, we've seen Act One of the gig economy, the on-demand economy, the sharing economy. We've seen what it means to call a car from your pocket. We've seen everybody start to try and apply that to every other industry. We've hmm. seen Airbnb. We've seen you know, sort of everything else that's happening. And I feel like we are now entering act two, uh, okay. right? We're sort of one turn of the wheel in. We're about to go uh, hit the second turn of the wheel. Mm -hmm. So we're able to you know, look to the future with a little bit of reflection and experience based on, on what's happened. Um, I think that's an opportunity. I think that's exciting. Um, one question that, that comes up and, and, and is helpful, you know, maybe good to reflect on here at South by Southwest, which is sort of the epicenter of, of hyping up, you know, internet issues, but the question is really how big is this? Is this, you know, is this profound because we read about Uber every day in the, you know, in the tech press, or is it just a really a tiny fraction of, of, of kind of what's really happening in the world. Is it really growing? Is it really transformational? Or is it more of a sideshow? Uh, how can we tell? How do we know? You know what do you, how seriously do we take all this? And, and how big is all of this? OK, I can, I can sort of take a stab at that. Who is um, that? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, <laughs> okay. um, So. You know, here, here's the way I look at it. I mean, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the camp that believes that we are at the early stages of something profound. Um, I think that every generation sort of overestimates the importance of the change that happens, um, like, you know, during their time. But notwithstanding that, um, you know, if you put this into context, you'll see that this, like, you know, what we're seeing in what we call the sharing economy today is a bunch of experimentation. Um, by a number of platforms, and this will evolve in a few years into a few standard models that will sit between the corporate model of the 19th and 20th century and the market model of the 18th century. Because if you sort of look back to the time that um, sort of the early economics textbooks were written, Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, um, they describe market economies where the typical person providing goods or services was a one-person shop or a one-person enterprise. Um, over the 19th and 20th century, um, that evolved into organizations of increasing complexity. Um, and we shifted from being a market economy to being an organizational economy. I mean, if you look at the United States now, a vast majority of the economic activity is organized in large corporations or government entities. People have full-time jobs. They do the same thing, like, you know, every day. And that's, that's how we organize the economy. But over the last 20 years, we've started to, with digital technology, invent a third way. Um, and so these entities that we call platforms like Uber, like Airbnb, like Etsy, like TaskRabbit and Handy, um, Funding Circle, um, they are um, sort of hybrids in some ways between traditional organizations and markets. They're not really markets. Like, you know, they, they have customer service. They have... Um, like, you know, sometimes they set price. Sometimes they help with merchandising. I mean, there's some coordination that is typically associated with an organization. But there are also markets in that, like, you know, an individual is providing to another individual. And so they've got some of the efficiency of markets and some of the efficiencies of organizations. We're seeing a wide range of different models, ranging from Uber and Lyft that sort of are more tightly coordinated to Airbnb that is somewhere in between. Um, to sites like Etsy that is sort of largely decentralized. And I think these are experiments, as I said earlier. Um, but what's going to happen is that a significant chunk of the world's economic activity in 20 years is going to be organized this way. Um, when you say significant chunk, what do you think? Uh, well, you know, making predictions about 20 years from now is sort of either a really unsafe or a really safe sort of enterprise, depending on, like, you know, this is not going to be archived, right? Okay, well, you know, I, I would say that, you know, what we see through these new networks or platforms will be comparable to what we see through sort of traditional organizations. Um, there's a big fraction of what people call the gig economy. Um, people sort of not working full time, but sort of providing on their own, like, you know, goods and services on their own. Um, that isn't mediated through platforms. I think a massive fraction of that will touch a platform in some way. So you can safely say that like, you know, 20% of the economy is likely to be quote unquote sharing economy. 
But my guess is that it's going to be more. I mean, I don't think that organizations are going to go away completely. Right. Um, but we've got an alternative now. And so some things are more natural to organize through sharing economy platforms. And so, uh, we'll see that sort of activity flow. Yep, so epic shift. Yeah. So I think Arun brings up something that is very important, and that is that people have been providing the kinds of goods and services that you see on quote unquote sharing economy platforms for as long as anyone has had the basic skills to provide a good and service. And what we have seen now is a complete revolution in the efficiency which with, with which those services can be allocated, to which you can meet a new customer, to which you can broaden your reach. You know, formerly your reach was your neighborhood uh, and people that you were confident enough to get in touch with. And via technology, you have been able to broaden your reach to literally anyone who is willing to access that platform. And so as an entrepreneur, that widens your market, that expands your earning potential to an incredible degree as a consumer, that completely revolutionizes the way that you consume goods and services, right? No longer do you have one option or two options based on what happens to be located near you. You have as many options as you are interested in accessing, as many options as there are platforms. Uh, so uh, as far as how ubiquitous does this become, it's always been ubiquitous. We've always had the sharing economy. Uh, it simply is much easier to use and it's much more efficient than it has ever been. And, and I think that more and more people will realize that when you have choices, they prefer that model, right? Who in a neighborhood wants to have only one overcrowded bus line, for example, and that's your only transportation option in that neighborhood? When instead you could have the ability to borrow your neighbor's car via a platform if they have an SUV and you need to borrow a, a car. You could have a car to go down the street and you could get in uh, one of those very efficient cars that you can park anywhere in town. You have multiple car services that could come to you. You have apps that will tell you what different public transportation and private transportation options there are. Uh, as a consumer, that's empowering. And so I think that you see more and more people realizing that they can personally reap the benefits of these platforms. And as that happens, you see that spreading more broadly across the economy. Not an entire new way of doing business, it's people being more efficient about doing the business that they've always done. So you're saying we've always had markets, and now we have super liquid markets, mm -hmm. hyper, hyper broad markets, super accessible markets, and it's just an, all of this has just accelerated something we've already had, exactly. rather than adding something brand new. I think it'll be consumer driven, right? People are interested in being able to choose to have options to access the best services. Yep. And this is helping facilitate that. So hold, I want to come back to that in a mm -hmm. second when we get to talking about labor and I want to I hear your answer as well. But I sure. also want to just pin the idea that if we're talking about markets like we've never seen markets before and efficiencies like we've never seen efficiencies before, it's going to bring us to the questions of like market power and how to make markets function well yep. and, and the role of regulation to make markets function well. And that's yep. something that uh, we've seen in plenty of other uh, parts of the economy, financial markets, you know, stock markets, so on. Um, and there's, and so I just want to sort of hold on to that idea and we'll come back to that. But Sarah? Yeah. I mean, I agree completely. Like, gig work ha has been around and probably the, the vast majority of workers working in these types of flexible arrangements outside of at these pla platforms right now is larger than those at any given point who are working on them. So the latest figure that I saw from the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute was at 0.5% of the workforce at any given point is working for an app-based labor platform. It's not the, the capital platforms. Today, right now? Today, yeah. like at any, in any 0. given 5 month. 0.5% of people working are working on on-demand platforms. Yeah, so this is, this is still, still a tiny sliver, and it's not a monolith either. So on the one hand, there are many more people who are working in flexible gig arrangements outside of new app-based platforms. And then within the group of workers who are working within app-based platforms, you know, some of them are actually paid and treated as employees. They have a regular schedule. They have benefits. And, th and the main innovation in those models that those companies are union using is on the consumer end. Mm -hmm. And they may also be achieving great efficiencies by introducing new ways to dispatch workers, to keep track of hours, which is really exciting for us. Um, because we want to ensure that workers are paid <coughs> properly. And yeah. they're also innovating in terms of, you know, different ways of providing benefits to their workers. So some companies are, are moving not only towards treating 
the frontline workforce as employees, but also ensuring that they have the same benefits as a much more highly paid tech staff behind it. Um, so I, I think that we are at a crossroads here. I think the crossroads may, or I would frame it slightly differently. We're at a point where we can determine now, do workers have a voice in how much they get to share in the profits that their labor is generating? Or is it the companies that continue to reap all of the benefits of some of these new flexible work arrangements? I think some of those questions will be answered not by us, but by the courts. Right now there's, and I'm sure a lot of people know that there's a lot of litigation pending against Uber. Um, and, it, and it may well determine that the workers are employees of the company. And I, and I think that will perhaps encourage some of the companies to move in a different direction and take more responsibility for the workers. And um, we're also seeing some exciting new forms of worker organizing. Um, and this is all happening at a crossroads too where the, the fight for 15, Black Lives Matter are, are introducing or, or prompting some really important discussions about wealth inequality and race in this country. So I think it's a really exciting moment. So although it's, this is still a tiny sliver, we really have a, a moment here to pivot towards strengthening protections for the workers and ensuring that they get to share in, in this innovation and the benefits that it's producing. Great, so yeah. uh, I wanna spend a bunch of time on that. But yeah. Before we get to that, um, you know, it's easy to focus on Uber drivers and sort of the, mm -hmm. the, the, the gig work that is sort of clearly in the press. Mm -hmm. um, but when I think about the macro change, it's not just about Uber drivers, it's also about, you know, musicians who are breaking out on SoundCloud yeah. or craftspeople YouTube. who are breaking out on yeah. Etsy or, you know, the, it's, it's very broad. And so, um, you know, how do we, I, I, I get, I think your point of view on the sort of epicness or non-epicness encompasses sort of yeah. all of that. Um, how do you uh, how do you think about that? Um, well, you know, one way to think about it is through the lens of um, you know how how do we adapt the regulatory structures that we've sort of built for the 20th century um, to uh, you know sort of include this 21st century way of um, organizing economic activity. And uh, do you want to jump to that? Yeah, well, so, uh, yeah, and, and maybe on the, just on the, on, on that last point, I think a challenge is that a lot of that is invisible. It's yeah. easy to count how much money Uber drivers are making, yeah. right? It's really hard to count the economic impact of, you know, musicians going direct to fans or, yeah. you know, citizen journalists going on Twitter. And that is all sort of a form of this network work, and maybe it's beyond the purview of this conversation, but yeah, cause, uh, cause, it, it um, speaks to the broadness or non-broadness. Non yeah, I mean, even if, if you go sort of even before SoundCloud and YouTube, you had the World Wide Web and then sort of Google sort of, you know, um, organizing the web for us in a way that allows us to sort of pay attention to what we want to pay attention to. And you can think of them as an early intermediary that was re-aggregating value from yep. decentralized value capture. and. You know, Hal Varian, who's the chief economist of Google, estimates that Google captures about a third of that value, yep. and about a two-thirds of it sort of flows to the creators. And so, and, and if you compare that to traditional record labels, yeah. are taking seventy percent, right? Yeah. And, I and, mean, and I'm so, still me on that. I mean, so to your point, Sarah, I think that there's a natural way in which um, I, I agree completely that we have to be vigilant. And I know we'll sort of get to the labor issue later. And Next, we, I'm, I'm sure we have lots <laughs> to say about it, but. Um, you know, I wanted to spend a moment on sort of the other side of regulation, um, outside of labor regulation, which is, um, you know, we want things to be safe. We want to make sure that markets function the way that we expect them to. Um, and we've put in place sort of like, you know, fairly elaborate structures over the last 200 years that um, sort of regulate the capitalist activity that, you know, we engage in every day. Um, this takes the form sometimes of um, industry groups. This takes the form of government agencies that are like, you know, setting and enforcing rules. Um, this sometimes takes the form of a brand sort of saying, well, we'll do the right thing, and mm -hmm. if we don't, then we'll be put out of business. And if you think about the activities that you engage in every day, like, you know, the food you buy, the um, sort of like, you know, the transportation you take, the uh, roller coasters you let your kids ride, um, <clears throat> you know, in some ways, there's a mix of brand and government that is uh, facilitating a feeling of safety. Um, you trust Six Flags, you don't trust the sort of like roller coaster park on the side of the highway. Um, you know, when you buy milk, you're trusting the FDA, but you're also trusting the brand. And that's, that's sort of the way in which we regulate things today. 
Um, but it's built for a world in which there is a large corporation on the other side of like, you know, that transaction. And Nick, I know you've written, I've read your blog for many years about like, you know, the need to reinvent regulation mm -hmm. um, to account for the fact that we live in this new sort of decentralized economy. And so my, my, my own feeling there is that we, we're going to have to sort of change the role of government from being the enforcer of regulations to sort of being the entity that we look to to sort of help set the rules and to provide oversight. And we're going to have to decentralize the regulation in a sort of systematic way. And I don't mean sort of just let platforms do what they want, but decentralize the enforcement of regulation in a systematic way, maybe by having peers regulate each other with government oversight maybe having platforms use the data that they have mm -hmm. to sort of do some of the work that the government had to do and provide an audited evidence of it. But, you know, um, I, I, I see a lot of variance. I've seen a lot of variance over the last three or four years in how cities are approaching regulating the sharing economy. Um, I think Austin is a great case in point. Um, like, you know, a couple of years ago, Austin was sort of a bright and shining example of forward-looking regulation um, for ride-sharing. Um, over the last year, that has changed, and um, there are sort of new sort of policies that are currently being contested that are in place that seem to sort of increase the role of the government um, from its 2014 level. And, you know, I, I, I think about the fact that, you know, there's the entities that we're regulating here are very different. You know, um, we've, we've got platforms now that can take on naturally some of the responsibilities that we as society yep. um, sort of used to have to ask the government for. I mean, when like, you know, ba back in the day of taxis, you couldn't have anybody <laughs> except the government sort of regulate the taxis, right? Now you've got Lyft and Uber, and the question is, but, but there's also sort of a different kind of workforce. I mean, I was told a few days ago that um, three out of four Lyft drivers in Austin drive less than 15 hours a week. And so we're not talking about a full-time workforce here. We're talking about people who are doing this casually. And so if the screening requirements are yep. too onerous, then you end up with a situation where people can't participate. Yep. And I think Etsy sellers have faced the same thing with, you know, if you impose regulations that were developed for toy manufacturers in China, yep. for the person who is making wooden toys and selling yep. them on Etsy, um, it's just a misfit. It doesn't mean that the objectives of regulation are any different. But the mechanism by which we sort of get to the outcome that we want as a society, and I, I see a sort of a quiet has sort of come well, over the room. Let's, let's, uh, let's stick uh, with that for a second. Uh, and, and it, okay, uh, uh, and I wanted to get back to something that yeah. you brought up earlier about mm. Uber drivers defining the debate about this, right? And, and I think that that entirely misses the point of where workers are going right now. And we were talking to a bunch of people <laughs> yesterday at Google who are YouTube creators. Yeah. And to define a debate about the future of workforce based on one platform and a very small yep. amount of workers mm -hmm. uh, who participate in that platform forgets the fact that when you talk to young people now about what they want to do with their lives, they say that I'm confident in myself and my ability to create something amazing as an entrepreneur, and I want to be able to run with that and be in charge of my own life. And yep. so that's on YouTube, that's on Etsy, that's on Uber, that's on Lyft, that's on Airbnb, whatever it is, we have a workforce that's entirely not conforming to the way yep. that our labor laws envisioned a workforce. Yep. Yeah. Well, Let's that's where I'm going to push back, because I think that some of the <clears throat> existing social programs, as unsexy as they are, I mean, I don't think that many people here are thinking a whole lot about social security, you know, based on the age and the composition of this room. But social security is inherently portable. It allows for drivers or workers working 15 hours a week to to be a part of the, that important social protection. And we have so underfunded some of our basic programs that people think that they're no longer relevant, but we could shore them up and ensure that workers, you know, whether they are employees or independent contractors, how many jobs they're working for, have a way to participate in those, and then build new programs that serve the other needs of workers. So, so we see at the city and state level, and we were talking about this earlier, some really new exciting programs to provide supplemental retirement 
um, paid extended leave, paid sick days. And those programs could be built to incorporate all workers, regardless of their classification or the number of hours they work a week or their label, in a way that ensures that people really have the stability that they need, no matter how many jobs they're working in a lifetime, and to give them the flexibility, honestly, to move on. I mean, th this is the other side of the coin, is, is when we risk so much by losing a job with an employer, you know, from my perspective as, you know, a former union organizer, you see that that really inhibits workers' ability to organize and to speak up and to demand more. But it also means that the, the stakes are so high for individual workers. See, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually disagreeing mm -hmm. with anything that you're saying here. I mean, I, I agree completely that, um, you know, there's a different model of providing, like, you know, we've moved to labor, so let's just sort of stick there for a minute. Um, the point I was making was about consumer protection mm -hmm. rather than yeah, labor well, protection. Let's, but let's get, I want to pause on the consumer protection because yeah. we can come back to that and talk about cities okay. and uh, stick but to I'll, the, I'll, the, I, the I just want to say yeah. one, one thing about this, which is that, um, you know, there's, um, I agree, we have social security and, um, like, you know, that's helpful. But the reality of the economy in the United States today is that the funding model for providing the social safety net is contingent on full-time employment. The good things that you get um, are either sort of, they're not provided by the government. The government's social safety net is extremely thin. Um, if you think about what a full-time worker gets that they value, a lot of that comes from voluntary contributions or mandated contributions from a corporation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you move to a world in which a large fraction of the workforce is not a full-time employee, you need a different funding model. Now, whether this funding model should involve the platforms mm -hmm. is an open question, but I think that it's backwards looking to say, let's sort of stuff Uber drivers back into sort of the full-time employee box as a way of getting them the benefits that come to full-time employees. They don't want to be full-time employees by and large. They want the nice things that go mm -hmm. with being a full-time employee. So, and so, to so I'm going to interrupt you for a yeah. second. So yeah. right, go we've ahead. got, there's I sort of two narratives. Yeah. 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 We're, 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 we're going to move forward. We're moving <laughs> forward. Don't worry. There's sort of two sides of this, right? There's uh, workers are so empowered because they're free and they can be creators and they can be independent on SoundCloud and on YouTube. Yeah. Or they're being, uh, you know, oppressed by the man and manipulated and, yeah. you know, uh, they don't have information and they don't have, you know, they don't have power and they can't organize. And, and all of those things are true because this is not monolithic. There yeah. are different models mm -hmm. and there are different ways. And I think... An interesting way to, for us to move forward would be, uh, I agree with you, Arun, that sort of old models, uh, all of our regulatory models, whether it's labor regulation yeah. or, trust, or safety, consumer safety regulation, were designed around the firm and were designed around an analog era where we didn't yeah. have data, we didn't have information and so on. We didn't have connectivity. So let's look forward. Mm -hmm. you know, let's imagine it's, it's 15 years from now. Uh, we've got autonomous vehicles. Uh, we've got the full deployment of these platforms. You know, Uber has gone out of business. It's the MySpace of ride sharing. Yeah. Um, whatever. You know, like what are the what are the things that that the future workers that are fully living in the digital economy are going to need to take the best of the freedom and flexibility that they have, and also have the protections that they need? What can we imagine that would be the most helpful and the most native to the internet? I mean, we're hearing a lot lately about portable benefits, and I think we probably all agree that we need stronger, more relevant portable benefit systems. No one agrees on what exactly that means or how we deliver it, so we can begin to flesh it out here. Um, ideally, portable benefits would allow for contributions to be made on a worker's behalf on a prorated basis so that no matter whether you're working 10 hours a week, 40 hours a week, you work, you know, intensively for three months out of the year for one company and then don't work for them for a while, the worker can accumulate those contributions into account, an account that follows them from job to job and allows also for workers um, who may also combine different types of work with different models to be able to continue to build those accounts and, and access them later. So what could fall into this? It could be you know, like I said before, paid sick leave, which we all need, um, extended leave, different types of unemployment insurance benefits. But I want to push back on your earlier point that all of these systems are built only around the model of full-time employment with a firm because they're not. I mean, we, we may not think of them as being portable, but Social Security is. When you get your notice, it, it you know, accumulates your contributions. 
Not all, <laughs> but you know. You, what you said was completely wrong, and what she's about to say is completely <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> Thank the you. Okay. that's my general <laughs> assumption yeah. about yeah. the world. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the job that I had for three months when I was in college um, yeah. made contributions, and it's still there, and, it, and it's reflected in my statement and, and what I'll get, you know, hopefully decades down the road. Mm. Um, unemployment insurance, too. You can work for multiple employers and have contributions made on your account. And then, you know, so long as you meet basic eligibility requirements, you can access, it's a really important benefit that allows workers to weather the storm. I think, you know, the problems are that fewer and fewer workers are able to access these. So I'd say the solution is not to completely dismantle or privatize the systems and then allow a corporation to, to make a profit on safeguarding workers' rights, but to update them to ensure that we're letting workers access them. And then to think about what are the other really crucial, critical benefits that workers need to have a stable career. Um, and, and some of those programs are in development and we've got to think about ways to strengthening, strengthen so them. So if I could ask you, Michael, yeah. if you were to imagine from your working with your companies at CTA, uh, we're in a world where there's portable benefits, right? And every platform, whether it's a W-2 or a 1099, participates in some way. It seems like at the heart of that is going to have to be information and transparency and some sort of openness within the market so that, you know, all of this can be transacted. We don't have that today. No. Uh, can you imagine how the companies you work with might you know, participate in, in that kind of a world and, and how that could all fit together? Yeah, certainly. So right now you have <coughs> like arbitrary floors and ceilings with I employment. So if you work 30 hours a week or more, uh, you are getting certain benefits that you are not getting under that. Yep. And again, that doesn't reflect the Whether you're, a, uh, even if you're a W-2 employee. Exactly. You can be a 29 hour uh, non-full-time employee. It does not screwed. reflect the way that people work I in today's economy. And so you have companies and you have individuals and you have organizations thinking about what the future of work looks like. I want to bring up what I think is one of the biggest obstacles to moving forward and getting to that 15-year future, and it's honestly the lawsuits that are going on here and now. There are lawsuits that are trying to do what Arun mentioned, which is to put modern workers into a binary 1930s box. Uh, and that is, how do you categorize someone that was never envisioned in a law? And, instead, and that is holding companies back. So right? what do they need instead? The, the legal uncertainty right, is preventing companies from doing right by their employees, from experimenting, from finding new benefit models. Mm -hmm. I think the way that we go, if you're going to lay out a course, is for a couple innovative cities and possibly states to try some new benefit models. You, know, you have some mayors. Yep. You have companies thinking about you know, portable benefits, about other benefit structures. Because at the end of the day, our member companies want to do right by the entrepreneurs that participate on their platforms. There's only one way that you attract people to participate on a platform. You know, for example, 80 some percent of Uber drivers, they participate on Uber because it fits their schedule for that sole reason, not because they're trying to earn a certain dollar amount, not because they're desperate and that's the only thing they can do. <coughs> it fits their schedule. So you're attracting people to work on a platform because it's what they want. Yeah. If they the moment that they feel like that platform is not serving them and doing what they want, they will leave. Well, what about, uh, so there's uh, the classic example is the taxi drivers in New York City around the time of the Great Depression. There were no jobs. Everybody became yeah. a taxi driver. Uh, what that ended up doing was uh, pushing the, the rates uh, that they would take down through the floor, and that led to the in, uh, creation of the medallion system. And yeah. ca cabs were capped at 13,000 yellow cabs in New York City to keep a price floor, essentially, for workers. Um, how can you, you know, you could imagine that happening, right? Super liquid marketplace, prices go through the floor. How do we, how do we solve for that? I think we're nowhere close to that right now, right? You know, that go back to that 80-some percent statistic. People want to participate on these platforms. It's not a matter of desperation. It's a matter of opportunity. And if we get to a place where workers feel like their only opportunity is to work for an incredibly low wage that doesn't exist on these platforms now, uh, we have broader economic problems, right? Uh, that's a broader economic issue in our country yeah. if workers are that desperate. Right now, workers are facing an incredible opportunity to become their own boss, to become an entrepreneur, uh, to gain confidence in selling a good or providing a service with an idle resource. Uh, honestly, uh, you, you hear that characterization in the news that this is people's only option, and I, yeah. I think it's completely unfactual. So I, I, I want to let Arun and, and Sarah respond, and then we can open it up for some questions. Yeah, and we've made it about 
Because I, I think forty percent of the way through the yeah. list of things we were going to discuss. So that's well, good. you know, we, we've hit on the important points, right? I think we all agree that um, you know we need portable benefits. Um, that you know there, there are these sort of little slices of the safety net that um, you know if they are tied to sort of like you know being attached for a long period of time to a corporation, they have to be detached mm -hmm. and somehow sort of made part of the worker and. You know, Libby Reader and uh, Natalie <coughs> Foster and Greg Nelson have been doing great work here. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think your narratives, I mean, Sarah's narrative is more consistent with sort of the threat of the disenfranchised worker narrative. Yep. And, um, you know, uh, your, your, your narrative is more sort of the empowered entrepreneur narrative. And I hear both of these narratives, the disenfranchised drone and the empowered entrepreneur. And both are right, right? And then the choices that we make today are going to be the ones that determine which one dominates. Because you see both of them happening. And, and, and that's and, where and it becomes a policy question, right? Yeah. And, how, do we, how do we steer things towards the empowered entrepreneur story and away from the disenfranchised worker story? And yep. what are the policy levers for that yep. in and the so, digital and era? And so you, you asked earlier, what do we do about this now, right? I mean, I see two, <laughs> two sort of concrete things that we can do in the short term. Um, one is that recognize that we're in a phase of experimentation and that we need to create some sort of safe harbor for the platforms to like, you know, demonstrate to us how much of this is going to come from the market. The US is never going to be an economy where the government is incredibly heavy handed and sort of dictates everything. The approach has always been, you know, we let the market sort of do as much as it can and then we sort of step in to correct mm -hmm. surgically. So right now, we don't really know whether if Uber is left to its own devices, will it provide benefits? We don't know whether Handy, who isn't providing training for its um, contractors because it's uh, worried that if it starts to train them, yep. then they will be considered They'll employees. They'll look like W2 employees. In that and, um, and so, you know, now the platforms claim that, like, you know, this, it's this, uh, these, this, these lawsuits that, um, you know, you brought up that are, um, so sort of preventing them from sort of taking these steps that are, you know, going to be good for their entrepreneurs in the long run. And so let's sort of test that. Let's create a safe harbor. Let's sort of tell the platforms for a period of time you're not going to have to, like, you know, worry about this, you know, sort of full-time employee independent contractor issue. Now go ahead and show us what the market's mm -hmm. going to provide. And then we can sort of get some data on what is actually going to happen. And to, to the point and, and that getting was, that data is important. How, how we get that data is a challenge. It's, 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 but it's, you know, it, it'll be evident, right? I mean, like, you know, if the safe harbor is created and we find that a lot of sharing economy providers don't have any benefits, then we'll know that government intervention is necessary. If it turns out that much like a number of corporations in America today, the platforms go above and beyond what the law requires in order to compete for talent in order to sort yep. of retain talent, um, then we know that we're sort of taking yep. a step in the right direction. And so it's, um, it's really a question of giving the market a chance um, before we, you know, I, I was at this conference I'm going to cut you over that. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, Sarah, you, <laughs> okay, you uh, respond. And has the market already uh, had that chance or, and or what else do you want to say? <laughs> And then we'll open up for questions. Sure. I mean, first of all, I, I really want to counter the notion that the only way to give workers flexibility is to um, decouple employment rights and responsibilities from the work. I mean, there, there are plenty of companies that allow workers flexibility, even as they make a commitment to those workers and treat them as employees. So, you know, number one. And, and number two, I think that technology actually facilitates that. I mean, there are so many more ways that all of us can, can log in, do the work where we want to, when we want to, um, and take assignments as they come up. And, and there are companies that are doing that, or nonprofits like mine, you know, in, in a way that really respects the rights and autonomy of, of workers. Um, I think what's really going to uh, make a difference in what happens in the new economy is how able workers are to organize. And whether that happens in the form of tradition, you know, more traditional labor unions, they're using new technology as tactics or tools to help them yep. to reach workers and helping workers to communicate, you know, to plan their actions and to share information. If we need some policy shifts to give workers in different structures new ways of organizing is going to matter a lot as well. Um, so I think the, 
that is the main determinant. And I think a lot of the larger economic problems that we've seen in this country, stagnating or even declining wages, growing wealth inequality, fewer numbers of workers who have benefits or any you know, predictable schedules is a result of the decline of, of labor, which now you know, has a membership of maybe just over 10%. So it's, it's really faded. On the other hand, I think some unions have organized you know, not only on, you know, in factories or hospitals or universities, but they've organized contingent workforces for a long time, and they can also serve as a model. So we see in the building trades, in music, in the arts, um, guild style unions that allow workers to really fight to protect their rights and their profile and reap the rewards um, that, that, they're, um, that they're giving, yeah. as well as to think about ways that workers can get benefits with contributions made throughout different employers. Yep. So we work with like the Screenwriters Guild, for example, and they're able to ensure that you know workers, even if they've got like three gigs a year or none the next year, and earnings you know that fluctuate or from different companies, that they're all paying into the same health and pension systems that have ensured that that group of writers. I realize it's you know pretty elite and kind of unusual, but it's not totally unique to this economy. And they you know so that union and others have kind of you know begun to figure this out, and we could see more models of union structures like that in the future, as well as new organizing in fields that either because they're brand new or they're changing so rapidly, traditionally haven't been organized yep. and where the workers haven't had the chance to really ensure that they're in the driver's seat along yep. with Uber or Honor or whoever it is. So okay, so one, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you. I'm, gonna, I'm really stopping you. So we wanna keep the innovation open. We wanna keep experimentation. We need information about how the market's actually working and we need to make sure uh, workers can actually organize. I think yeah. those are two pretty good principles and now I wanna open it to questions. Matt Stempick. Hey guys, uh, thanks. I was obviously <coughs> talking to a lot of dogs out here. <coughs> I'll use the microphone because I'm, I'm on like day six. Introduce yourself. yourself. My name is Matt Stempeck. I work at Microsoft on civic technology. Sarah, I think it's an interesting point that workers are finding new ways to organize because um, the platforms are also organizing their, their <laughs> labor yeah. and their users um, in regulatory battles around the world, which yep. I think is fascinating. Yep. <laughs> um, but just one question for you guys. There's this idea of creative destruction uh -huh. that every time technology kills a class of jobs, it's also opening up new, often better futures. Uh, but there's some concern these days that it's out, technology is outpacing our ability and our labor ability to adapt to these new jobs. Yeah. So my question is, has the cycle, including AI and self-driving cars, has the cycle gotten faster than our labor pool can keep up with? And if so, how do we support people um, to rapidly re-educate, retrain at the speed of you know, Moore's Law? And let's try to keep answers short so we can get a bunch of Sure, I mean, oh, I, oh. I, can, I can say really quickly that <laughs> I think that the, um, why don't you go ahead? Right. Okay. So, <laughs> maybe that's for me. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. No, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give okay. two really quick answers. Guys, so really yeah. quick. Brief, brief, brief. Let's professor. go. Yep. Um, so, number one, I mean, we, we've had a long standing problem where there's you know, no worker basically who wants to assert their right, rights can get, you know, a, a, a rapid response necessarily or predictably rapid response from labor regulators. I mean, for long we've, we've starred, starved state departments of labor and USDOL of the resources to respond rapidly, not only to help workers who have real claims, to, but to provide the education and resources to both workers and employers. So, I, I mean, we really need to do a better job of investing in that line of defense. And then I think you're absolutely right. We need to ensure that workers have access to, you know, not only training, ideally in the form of free education, which one of our presidential candidates is proposing, or, you know, maybe more depending on how you count it, um, but also, you know, the stability during periods of unemployment so that workers have the ability to access those. So, th so that's why I think it's really important, too, to ensure that workers have unemployment insurance and, and paid leave so they have the, uh, the economic opportunity to take advantage of those retraining and education opportunities. So our, our laws have certainly not kept pace with our labor force. Uh, our labor force, I think, has kept pace. If you look at who's participating in sharing economy platforms, it cuts almost evenly across age groups. You have people in the 70s to 80s age group participating at almost exactly the same rate as uh, providers as people in the you know, 18 to 25 age range. And so people are adapting, they are finding these techno new technologies, they're finding new opportunities there, uh, regardless of whether they grew up with the technology or they're brand new to figuring out how it works. 
Next okay, question. So I'm, I'm in the front. <laughs> Sorry. I actually have an answer to his question. <laughs> well, all right, let's hear it. You, 30 seconds. Um, I think the pace of automation has accelerated in professions where people are paying attention to the pace of automation. It used to be that the automation was always sort of destroying jobs, but it was destroying jobs of people who weren't paying attention to automation. Now it's in sort of the high-end professions, and so we're more worried than we used to be. But I don't think we've hit that inflection point yet. Good answer, and really yeah. crisp and short. Mm -hmm. sure. you're, 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 you're a good moderator. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm Janai. I'm coming from Istanbul, another part of the world. So um, I love what, what you, you guys are discussing here. And I am very much into innovation, because I believe innovation is more about uniting, uniting people for a purpose and creating models so that we can replicate all around the world regardless of companies, associations, countries, and yep. hopefully generations. So my question to you guys is how we can make it a more like a purposeful approach to innovation instead of just talking about models? Because shared economy is because we are informed decision makers right now, and we have the more capabilities. I think it's better to be more proactive than being yeah. reactive. And what is our approach, and what is the next mission you have? So you know, lest I seem like I'm a stick in the mud, let me give a, take a stab at that, which is, I mean, I do think that there is a role to play in ensuring that the platforms have built into them from the outset ways of ensuring that workers' rights are protected. We work closely at NELP with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which has an innovations lab that's thinking about ways to work with the corporations to ensure that the model that they're using from the tech perspective ensures that the consumers and the corporation um, are providing what workers need. This is the good work code, correct? This is a good work code. Good and work code. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, listen, I, I, I think that ultimately we need the power of really strong workers organizations behind that in order to, to hold the companies to their promises. But there are, there are plenty of examples of companies that are moving towards or want to do the right thing and ways that I think that we can work from the outset together, you know, workers, labor advocates, and that based companies to make sure that we've got an understanding of what workers need on the job, you know, what they need to earn um, a family supporting wage, to have benefits and protections. And then within the model, ensure that, that, that the technical aspect meets those needs and rights and protections. I would also add that a lot of companies are uh, trying to compete on values. So there's a company called right. Juno that's yep. uh, worker-owned Uber that's, that's going to start in New York. There are a bunch of other companies that are trying to use values mm -hmm. and mission as their hook into the market. Unproven if that's really going to work or not. And, and you know, in, in, in some ways, I mean, I, I'm really excited by, um, like, you know, to, to watch Juno unfold. I mean, they've committed half their founder stock to drivers sort of over the long run and whether they can actually sort of, you know, embed themselves in a yep. marketplace that is dominated by Uber and Lyft will be interesting in New York. But, you know, I think that there is, perp you know, I think the, the issue of making sure that people are well protected who provide um, is certainly like a critical one but it's not the only kind of purpose that might sort of drive someone yep. to want to innovate through a platform. And I think that there's a lot of exciting opportunity in the sharing economy here because, you know, that th there is like, you know, fundamentally what's part of the model is the sort of decentralized innovation. There's so much innovation that takes place on Etsy that wouldn't be possible mm -hmm. otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little bit of innovation that takes place on Airbnb. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that we, We've, we've got to make sure that, like, you know, we don't lose the safety net that we've sort of assembled for the industrial economy, that it, we don't look back in 20 years and say, like, you know, but we shouldn't make that the only issue um, because there's a tremendous amount of other kinds of purpose. Don't throw that Like, you know, sort of word. reducing inequality of, yeah. like, you know, sort of social impact that so can be sort of empowered. The the uh, I want to speak economy, to that so. very, very quickly. <laughs> um, having recently been in Istanbul and being very impressed by the entrepreneurial spirit of so many people there and the incredible things that they were doing, by having platforms that people around the world can seamlessly access, you empower someone who is already entrepreneurial wherever they are in the world to expand their reach. And so we were talking to a carpet seller, actually, in Istanbul, whose brother lived in Houston, and they both worked together to sell their goods online. And he was talking about how this has just made his business grow wildly, because locally, he's, committing, he's competing with so many carpet sellers. And now he has reached in the United States, he has reached in Istanbul, and he has reached all over the world 
via online sales. And so if people who are selling goods already, they already have the infrastructure, they already have the skills, if they can access a platform to which those wares suddenly go to the global market, that is incredibly empowering for them. In the back. Uh, uh, just to say who you are, briefly. So I'm, I'm uh, Bill Nottingham from uh, Nottingham Spurk in Cleveland. We're about a 44-year-old company, and um, about two years ago, we established unpaid, unlimited paid time off for our associates. And you feel if you have the right team and you respect them, they respect you, it reaps and rewards. Right. And I think that more companies should do those types of things to battle, or not battle, but to, to kind of be playing around with a shared economy. So mm -hmm. the companies that aren't doing shared economy, they can share with their employees. And right. I thought that could be something. So I touched Absolutely. on this earlier with the fact that a modern worker, if they're dissatisfied with the platform that they're working for, or if they're dissatisfied f with, you know, if they're a W-2 employee and they're working at a you know, law firm or anything, if they're dissatisfied, they leave. They go yeah. do something else. They're, they're confident in their own capabilities. And so things like paid time uh, off being, you know, uh, unlimited, placing trust mm -hmm. in people that work for you, placing trust in people that are entrepreneurs on your platform, it's empowering, it makes them feel like they're valued, and it makes them stick around. It makes them feel like they're taken care of, that someone trusts them. And yeah. so I think that's enormously important. I mean, I think that as sort of traditional corporations have to contend more and more with uh, the platform model, not just in things that were traditionally freelance, like, you know, you know taxi driving was freelance, sort mm -hmm. of like domestic work was freelance, and now it's platform-based mm -hmm. freelance. But you know, you've got Hourly Nerd that is taking MBAs online. You've got Universal Avenue, sort of a sales force. You've got Gigster that is sort of software development. So, um, you know, as the threat to, uh, as the sort of the process of competing for talent sort of transcends just competing with the other company and starts to become competing with this new flexible form of work, I think what you're doing in your company is going to increasingly become a way of competing for retaining the talent because you're sort of replicating some of the absolute flexibility that you get on the platforms within the sort of confines. I hope you can make it work. Mm -hmm. Tech companies great, are really yeah. good at doing that with their employees yeah. right. uh, and attracting employees yeah. that way. But NYU does that as well. I mean, Harder I can take as much time off as I want, but. Because paid time off yeah. is just time off. Yeah. Uh, we, have time, oh, sorry. Uh, we have time for one last question, okay. which is right there and then Gary. Mm -hmm. You don't get a question, you get some sort of concluding statement or something. But go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I say who you are. Uh, hi, uh, Ted Graham. Uh, I'm an author of the book called The Uber of Everything. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in our, our research is the number of sharing economy companies who are spending probably half on technology and half on regulatory sure. compliance. Yeah. Um, just maybe some comment about if this is, shows great promise, what are we going to do about the cost to the companies that are trying to comply and do the right thing? Well, I, I, can, I can say something real quick about that. Um, I think one of the things that these, you know, it's, it's excessive, right? I mean, uh, from, from, from the looks of it, there are billions of dollars that these platforms are spending on lobbyists, on regulate, sort of like, you know, changing regulations on um, lawyers. Um, but in some ways, what these platforms are doing are sort of piece by piece trying to restructure our regulatory system to be better suited for the economy of the future. Now, they might be doing it in a self-serving way, but you know, once you start to dismantle something, the way it's reassembled, um, like you know, sort of up to the policy makers, so I think that they're creating a public good in a way by sort of doing the dismantling, and it's up to us to sort of reassemble it right. So I, there's I two, a, there's two things we gotta, going we gotta, on. We gotta stop. No. I heard a, uh, a statement that was the, the platform companies aren't disrupting industry, they're disrupting government. Yeah. So that makes sense. So we, we're done. We're out of time. Uh, uh, we we got to go to Gary Shapiro. Yeah. You don't have to. Go ahead. Uh, Gary Shapiro, thank you all for presenting very, really, very fascinating. This could go on for four hours. I will say there are two visions presented. One is, this is what our nation was founded on. It's freedom of people to cut deals with other adults without the government being involved. That's why we fought a battle with, with England and won. And, it's, and we're going forward in different ways now, and we don't know which way it's going. And the other is, the government must, must step, and this is the Department of Labor some of you, and you haven't mentioned that the Department of Labor, by the way, is, which is kind of, let's be honest, is run by union former officials, has basically said now that if you, if you make less than $50,000, you must be paid overtime. And they also have a proposal out there, not a proposal, a rule that just issued two weeks ago that says we will label everyone we can 
an employee rather than an independent contractor. So if we were, we're heading towards a point where if your kid's shoveling snow in New York as I was, or doing odd jobs and lawn mowing to make money, then I'm entitled to portable bed benefits and vacation off and things like that. And adults will not be able to cut deals with other adults or even with kids to, to do stuff. And, and totally end flexibility in the economy. And what we've seen is we've seen now 26 states have right to work laws and they've done better than the, the 24 that have, uh, you, it says you must be part of a union to do certain jobs. We've taken away choice from people and that's what you're advocating for. And obviously it's not something I believe in at all. Well, when you put it that way. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is the way we're going. That's the choice we're facing. What I hear from the other panelists who are obviously not as extreme as I am on this, is saying, let's just see how this plays out before we step in and put all these mandates because we're going to choke innovation. And that's where we come down. I don't think we have a chance to respond, but uh, obviously there's a lot to dig into here. Thank you guys so much, yeah. Arun, Michael, Sarah, uh, and everybody here yeah, uh, at IPD for hosting and being here.